Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I just wanted to get a quick gauge. I'm gonna do my test first. How many people here do TDD? How many people here do it successfully? Like really believe in it and really love it? Okay. Um, how many people here, how many people are here to get that confidence or get that to be sold on TDD? <laughs> and who wanna do it? Okay. So what I would like at the end is for those same people to have their hands raised and say, well, at least I wanna give it a try. Uh, so, with no further ado, I, I want to kind of get through these slides as, as fast as possible, but I did want to do at least a quick intro of what TDD is. Um, the, the number one thing I think of in TDD is I think there's, you don't write any code at all without a test first. Um, and uh, the, the next quick step, who here has heard of uh, red-green refactor? There's, there's something pretty important about this red-green refactor. There's, there's a concept of the red bar. You want, you want the test to fail, which gives you that red bar, and then you want it to pass, which gives you the green, and then you want, it, want a refactor. Well, why is that refactor part important? Uh, instead of saying test, uh, sorry, uh, red-green refactor, I like to say red-green refactor. Give it a little bit of time, because now it's green. You can spend your time and make the code a little bit better. Uh, TDD isn't just for unit testing. Uh, it's used in, uh, for example, I just used it in this uh, presentation. Hopefully the test passes at the end. Um, it's used in acceptance testing. Uh, and uh, it, um, and the, the, the other important piece here is that it, uh, I've been doing it for a little while and I still learn every day. Um, I've, I've been on a team where I've helped mentor several people and they get it. Um, a after some time, but even they are continually learning. So it's not something that you're going to learn in three hours or something like that. It's something that you've got to be, you got to be sold on first, and then you've got to want to do it. And once you start doing it, you start learning the, the, the trade. I, this is my own personal opinion. I don't think, I, this is one of the practices in Agile, one of the many practices which aren't easily reproducible. It takes practice. Um, so the sales pitch, look, Ma, no hands. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to go back to this other one for the sales pitch as well, where you see the um, picture of the guy. He's got that kind of umbilical cord. He's got that cord, right, hanging off him. And he knows that even though he's going to fall, he's got something to hold back on. And th th that's kind of something I'd like to have you guys experience today. So the, the things, there have been several research papers, several studies on TDD. Um, and it's pretty hard to talk about them all for the sales pitch. So what I like to do is, is that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do a little selfish spin on this. What, why I, as a developer, would wanna do TDD, not why my manager wants to do it or why it'd be good for the, the company. Why is it me? So you might ask the question, well then, what do I care about 50% reduction in bugs? Um, well, let, let's go over these really quick. So one thing that I found um, by looking at these, these different, um, experience reports and whatnot, is they all seem to talk about a reduction in bugs. And while I say I'm trying to sell you individually, this is also nice for executive level to say, hey, this does maybe make, make some sense. Um, and so the, the first two are bug density. The, the last one, which I like, is confidence. This is what it's all about for me. I know that my code works. I find that I do the acceptance level testing a little less when, I, when I'm writing my code because I know that it's already tested at the lower level. So I don't, for web application development, for example, I don't spend a lot of time deploying the application and testing login and testing all these little perspectives. I do do that, don't get me wrong, I just don't spend near as much time on it because my unit tests tell me. So, uh, show of, I, I, I kinda wanna do a quick uh, collab thing going on here. What is the cost of a bug? So I, I started out and I said, well these are some things that happens when a bug is found by QA. So can anyone think of any more? There are several on here. In fact, I was recommended to take some off so that you guys could come up with some ideas. So when a bug's are found, you have to find the bugs to reproduce the bug. You have to find the steps to reproduce the bug, right? Then you have to, yes? The, uh, the cost that's associated with fixing the bug and then causing other bugs. Okay, that's good. Thank you. You actually got to the next slide. There's a time for the, the, the developer to acknowledge the bug 
to then test the bug him or herself, and then to uh, note in Jira or whatever the tool is that bugs been closed. Okay, so those are, is that two or three things? Three. And so for the developer to acknowledge the bug, is that just the developer looking at it, or does it also sometimes need to get prioritized? It, the developer who handles the bug may not, have been, may not be the person who... Oh, so he just got, he just got in his queue, right. and he's acknowledging it, trying to build context. Right. How much time do you think that would take? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. And then what was the other one? Uh, fixing it? Fixing it, and then going into the system and acknowledging that it's been fixed. Okay. So I want to I skip fixing it, because that's kind of a hard one. Uh, Three minutes, four years, I, hopefully not four years, but a, a very long time to a very short time. Um, so what about, uh, what about in? So resolve, going in and... and yeah, that's like two minutes. Two minutes, okay, so far it's at 12 minutes then. Okay, so, yes? Um, if the bug is released, it could affect customer loyalty. Okay, if the bug's released, it could affect customer loyalty. Thank you. Yes? QA has to validate the fix. How long does that? Retest the code. Pardon me? We have to retest the code, do it again. They have to retest the code and do it again. So how long does that take? Just a quick number. Oh, that's all I'm interested in. 10, 15 minutes, okay. <laughs> does... Well, in some cases you have to triage the bug and prioritize it so somebody has to have a meeting about Okay, so the, that's right. So and, and how many people does that include? Six. Six. And so let's say that you're going over one bug. Five minutes for each person in the room, so that's 30 minutes. Okay, so now we're at about an hour. And, and we haven't talked about finding the steps to reproduce the bug. I, I know in many cases that could take 30 minutes, uh, an hour sometimes. I found a bug, now how do I make it so development can consume this and reproduce it? So now we're looking at about an hour and a half there. Um, what about uh, just dev and QA sitting down and discussing it? Five minutes, 10 minutes, okay. Are there any more? Yes? The argument where the developers cast blame at each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, the argument where dev cast blame. So how much time do you think that's, that costs? Uh, here from a half hour to half hour. Half hour, so, so let's be modest and say a half hour. So now we're at about two hours and 20 minutes or something, yes? Then you have the argument between whether it really is a bug or whether it's a configuration issue. Okay. Good, so another 15, 20 minutes. So let's just cap it off and say about three hours is what a single bug costs, and it, it depends. Um, for example, what if the customer found the bug? Now do, you need to, now do you need to include more people in that process? Does it need to get prioritized differently? Um, and that, this was brought up, what, what if it introduces new problems in production? So quick vote, really quick. How long then do you think this all might add up to be? What, what's a, a pretty modest amount of time that that bug costs without even fixing it? Six hours? Going once? Going twice? Okay. Uh, so what does this mean to me? Well, how many bugs are in your current project? Any, any takers? 40? It's only one per line of code. One per line of code. <laughs> so a, a recent, yes, okay. A thousand. A thousand, all right. So now we, we go back to the numbers and say that there's between a 40 to 90% reduction in bugs. So let's just take it, let's just say 50, because that's, I'm, I'm a simple person. Um, so that's, you just reduced 500 bugs, and we said about six hours. So six times 500 is how many hours? 3,000 hours. So as a developer, what that means to you is, I get to spend more time coding, and less time fixing bugs. So I don't know what this duck's doing here, but um, I'd like to do a demo on the Fibonacci sequence. But I want to take a couple minutes and just explain what the Fibonacci sequence is. is would anyone here like to explain it? Yes? Sure, it's the sum of, it's a series in which you take the first number and the second number, and you add those together. You add each number with its previous two, <coughs> Okay, good. So it's like n minus one plus n minus two. So if you're, if you're looking at the Fibonacci sequence for five, it would be five, the Fibonacci sequence for five minus one, which is four, plus the Fibonacci sequence of five minus two, which is three. One, one, two, three, five. Okay, good, and, and there are the numbers up here. Uh, I, ha I have a cheat sheet. Um, 
uh, which is right here. <laughs> so I'm actually gonna, I'm using IntelliJ, and, and there's a couple things I wanna demo. I don't have a lot of time to talk about them specifically, but I'm gonna be using InfiniTest, um, which is something that runs in the background. While you build your code, it just, it's running the tests in the background, and it only tests the code. It only runs tests for the code that's been changed which is nice when you start getting many, many tests. Um, and it's also nice thinking that I only need to run this one unit test when I change this code and you find out there's actually lots of other unit tests that need to be run. Um, and two, it saves time. So I'm in IntelliJ, I'm gonna create a project, um, just call it TDD demo. Maven, I'm gonna make it a Maven module. <laughs> So to start out, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna, uh, because InfiniTest requires Java 1.5 for now, hopefully that gets changed in the future, I have to switch that to 1.5 and then I'm gonna add InfiniTest as a module to the application. So for unit testing, the first thing I like to do, well, this is gonna, I'm gonna write my test first, which is just gonna be, well, not really write it, but agile roots.tdd, and then notice I created my, uh, package in my test directory first. <laughs> test package first. Thank you, Kay. All right, so the first thing I, I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a little hookup test. Um, what's a good name for this class? Let's say it has lots of algorithms. Okay, I'll call it algorithms. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Great. So let me start up IntelliJ again really quickly. Uh, I, I, while I'm doing this, I kind of have a funny uh, story. This morning, or last night before I went to bed, I saw that OS X had some updates to it, and I thought to myself, I probably don't want to do this because it might cause problems in my presentation tomorrow morning. And so I woke up and I saw that it all restarted and I thought, you know what, I need to test to make sure that my presentation's gonna work. So I started it up and this very same thing happened. And when I did that, I found that sometimes I had to restart IntelliJ. So another, in this case, test afterwards, but I thought of the test before I did the presentation at least. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm using JUnit. I'm just gonna call this a, a hookup. and I'm just gonna fail the test. And believe it or not, failing means it worked. Um, I am using Maven. I kinda wanted to show some of you the, the, uh, the, the benefits of fully working in your IDE. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna add um, JUnit as a Maven module, so now it can be built with Maven as I'm running along as a dependency. And here I'm just gonna go ahead and, and include the static import for fail. And um, the, the infinity test should be running, so now I can build it. And you see I get a failure. Yes, that means my tests are all hooked up, my build works, now I don't have to worry about all that. Now I'm gonna write my first test. Um, what I'm gonna do is, when I do tests, I like to first test the exceptions. So. Since there aren't any requirements on this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a new requirement, and that is I'm not gonna worry about negative numbers. Um, so in order to do that, I'm just gonna simply look for a uh, illegal argument exception, because I don't really wanna create a new exception. And I'm gonna do a, uh, so what's the, what's the first Fibonacci sequence? What's, what's zero for Fibonacci? Okay, so sequence number, oops. Zero. I'm ahead of myself. Um, algorithms dot Fibonacci, I'm gonna pass it zero. All right, so now I have to worry about some things here. Yeah, go ahead and import my assert. It, uh, it says it's no, it doesn't know about a class called algorithms. Let's go ahead and create that. And now it says it doesn't know about a method. 
called Fibonacci. Let's go ahead and create that. For now, I'm gonna have it return an int since, well, hopefully I don't have to explain that. Ne uh, negative one. So now I'm checking what? The first one is zero. So we, we talked about red, green refactor. So what am I doing here? I'm getting the red. So let's build it. Uh, oh, whoops, sorry. Wow, I'm way ahead of myself. So I'm looking for negative one. Please correct me when I'm going. I need your uh, participation here. So, and, and obviously the name probably isn't very good anymore. So Fibonacci negatives. So it does fail. It says it is expecting an illegal argument exception that doesn't exist. So how do I make that pass? By throwing the exception. So what if I just do this? Will that make it pass? Okay. Now I don't have to worry about that. It's running in the background. It'll just go ahead and pass, I hope. Um, but now, to really do it, I should probably do if the num is less than what? You can tell it passed because the green bar on the bottom yeah, the, is black. That is supposed to be green. <laughs> if it weren't for the, uh, the wonderful hue or whatever, that, the pink. So num minus, if num is less than zero, thank you, then throw an exception. Otherwise, I want to return. Uh, you know what, for now I'm just going to leave this throwing an exception. I'm going to write a new test. Um, so what's another test I could write? Okay, so I'm just going to call this the first few. So assert equals um, sequence. So when, when I do my unit test, I really, really like to put down the comment of what it is I'm testing. Because after a while, you start getting things and the test fails, and you're like, well, why did that fail? And you got to go look at the code to figure out why it failed. This little message tells you where it failed and why it failed. You don't have to go back and figure it out. So I'm looking for zero algorithms dot Fibonacci of zero, and that should return zero. Is it going to, is it going to, am I going to get a, well, maybe it's the same color bar no matter what. Okay, it, it actually shows red, so maybe we'll say red and not red. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't work the way expected, so I have to do a little bit of refactor here. I can't just return zero, right? So I, I, now I need to do, now I'll do my check. If, by the way, there's no science behind this. I could have done it completely differently. It doesn't matter in, in many cases. In fact, the way I, I, I practiced this a little bit before, and I never did it this way. This is the very first time I'm doing it this particular way. Um, so we talked, you guys all answered the question, check if it's less than, less than uh, num, then I wanna return I want the test to fail first to make sure that my test is valid. Does everybody understand that principle? If you have a failing test and it shows red first, and then it shows green, how much more confident are you that the test actually does something correctly, that it's checking something right? Versus if it's not red, if you just write a test and it always passes, are you sure that that test is actually testing something? I have actually written tests that pass no matter what. And I didn't find that out until I had a bug. And I went to, to say, no, that test shows that it works. And then I went and fixed the back end, and it didn't change. It still, it still passes. Like, OK, time to change the test. When, when is it going to fail here? Uh, so it's really important to get the red-green part of this here. OK, so now it's red. Now how do I make this pass in the shortest time possible? Return zero. Return zero. Thank you. <coughs> All right, so now I'm going to introduce um, I'm kind of going to jump around a little bit. What, what's another problem with this particular algorithm? It's returning an int. At what point might it blow up when it returns an int that's larger than? Pardon me? The size of the integer. The size of the integer. OK, so I'm going to still throw an illegal argument exception, except this time I'm going to, I'm going to test something that's too big. I happen to know uh, that 47 is larger than the max, which is this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write a test for that. And therefore, I still expect an illegal argument exception when I pass 47. Does, there, does that make sense to everybody? Any questions right now? 
silence. Um, okay, so I got the failure, so now how do I change this to, to make the test pass? I need your help. Yes. Okay, so I can say if num is uh, greater than 46, is that good? Will it pass? It'll, oh, it'll pass, but it's not good. Why is it not good? Thank you, Jonathan. No negatives. Is that descriptive enough? No. Um, uh, and or nor nums. Wow, if I could only type greater than 46. How's that, Jonathan? Wonderful. That's what I thought. I, all right. Green bar. Green bar. At least it is over here. All right, so now I'm going to introduce the next test. What am I going to test? First sequence? What's the first sequence? Or what's the sequence number one? One. Now I'm introducing a code smell here, or a test smell. What, what's the test smell? Copy, paste. So, pardon me? Okay, multiple search for a test. Um, and the fact that I did copy paste here, which I'm, I'm going to fix in a minute, but before I fix this refactor, I want to make sure that my test actually passes. So, how do I make it pass? Can I say return num? And I'll do a quick refactor here. Um, So how do I change the sequence number zero? What do I need to do here? Key value sub what? So here I've got the, right, right here I'm saying that the zero one, I expect it to be zero, and the sequence number one, I expect to be one, so I'm gonna say that sequence key of key value equals key sub of, of uh, zero, and this should be key sub, key value sub one or two or zero. One, thank you. And that's for zero. So, uh, make sure my test still pass after the refactor. Maybe get rid of this extra test. Now I've got one assert. Sorry, bad joke. Anyways. Um, so now what do we need to test? It, it, it'll get more interesting in a second here. The second one maybe, sequence number two, and what's it? One? Failure. Uh, how do I make this pass? Returning num no, no longer works. What do I need to do? I need to do a refactor here. I, I need to actually what? Do the sequence. I need to actually do the sequence. So there are different ways we could do the sequence. What's a good way? Iterative or uh, recursive? Should we do a cursive? Sure. Okay, so if num equals zero, then do what? By the way, my code's ugly for a reason. I just want to get this done. Return zero. Otherwise what? Well, in this case, all I have to worry about is one. Is that right? And my test passes, I hope. Okay, let's get to that point. That's good. So now, now we can worry about the bigger numbers. So I'm so good at uh, method names, I'm going to call it 
bigger nums. <coughs> and now I just copied and pasted, which is another problem, do you think? So uh, uh, I'm going to use a little refactor here. Create a method called uh, fib test, test fib, whatever. Boom, now. Uh, okay, so now I'm doing bigger numbers. So the bigger number would be three, and what's the Fibonacci of three? Two, thank you. All right. Uh, if num is less than or equal to two, then return one. Is that going to work? Is that going to make it pass? Otherwise, return two. Okay, we're going to be here all day. Thank you for that. So now let's go to the next. Uh, now let's go to the next number, which is four. And what's the Fibonacci sequence of four? Three. Um, so so now this this isn't really going to work anymore. So. Uh, you brought up that we do what? Fibonacci of what? N minus one. Can we, can we just say plus one and will that pass? A little weary. It passes. Oh. oh, thank you. Fibonacci of num minus two. How confident are you that this test, now that I did this refactor, how confident are you that the test is still going to pass or fail? Or that if it passes, how confident will you be, in, in, at least in the test we've written so far, that it still works? Raise the hands. Confidence level. That's not very many. Two people? Okay. It, it, it passes. Um, now my confidence goes up. Huh? Now my confidence is up. Now your confidence has gone up. Now how many people are confident <laughs> that this works? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, but what, does anyone have any concerns about the algorithm that I'm doing here? Let, let's, let's put, what, what's, what's five? What's the Fibonacci of five again? Five? So, confidence level, did it go up a little bit? Uh, I'm going to say mine hasn't. The, the reason is, is that I'm going to... Five should be three. Zero, zero, one, two, three. Which, yeah, three is four. Five is five. So uh, does anyone know the, the 40 second Fibonacci sequence? Uh, there it is. So if this passes, how confident will you be that, that we just came up with a good Fibonacci sequence algorithm? How many people would raise their hand if this passes that it's good? Okay. Ugh. That, that's yellow still running. Okay. So after some time it ran, are you happy with the time that it takes to run it? No? Well, let's just, let's just throw another number in there just to make us really unhappy. <laughs> All right. So while that's running, I, I, I'm going to declare that this method that we came up with via TDD isn't the most efficient method. We're using recursion. Recursion can have problems with memory and slowness, as we can see. So I, I'm going to take a mathematical approach at this. And uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to watch me for a minute. Not, not a lot of feedback on this one. There's only 46. Why don't we just do a lookup table? <laughs> OK. That would work. OK, thanks, Kay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create this little algorithm, square root of 5, all divided by 2. That's phi. I'm going to comment this out, um, and then I'm going to return math.floor, math.pow of phi to the num, and I'm going to divide that by 
the square root of five, and just adding the half just seems like a good thing. How many people are confident that this algorithm is gonna work? <laughs> no one? Why not? Less code. What's it gonna take for you to get confident that this algorithm works? So let's say we didn't have any tests. How would you know that this algorithm worked? Okay. And even after that, would you still be confident? Or would you still want to run math, you know, software tests against it, whether it's manual or whatever? So, so just for grins, you saw how long that last one took. Oh, look, it's already done. And it passes. So now how many people are confident that this algorithm works? You're still not confident? There's some people that didn't raise their hand. I'm just wondering why they're not confident. Too tired. Too tired? <laughs> Um, yes? Because we really only have one large number being tested, right? Two large numbers, 42 and 46? Uh, then I'm confident. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here, 42 and 46. So now you're more confident? You could, we could add more and you can gain confidence? Yeah, that's good. All right. So this, this ends the demo. Um, how many people in here that originally raised their hands that came here for a little bit of oomph that I want to try to do TDD? How many people in here are now more interested in doing TDD? So that's about half of the people that originally said that they were interested. So that's 50% success rate. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I, my eyes don't work exactly right. So. Um. I wonder if you have to write a test before you can write any code, then I have to write a test before you can write a test. <laughs> and if that's the case, then you have to open it up in front of recursion. So, so, writing a test for the test? Yeah, because the test is code, so you have to write but, a test. But that, the test is right. but, that, but that test code isn't going into production. And that, and that test code is also very, very simple of saying, this is my expectation. So, so, so what the test is saying is the test is saying, this is what I expect the software to do. Um, and therefore, I'm going to write the software to behave as it would expect, as you would expect it to happen. Does that answer it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm confident on that one. I mean, the fact that we expect it to, to fail initially sort of satisfies that. We're testing the test by seeing that it fails. Any more questions? Go for it. Any other questions? I am good to be a while. What about those people that didn't raise their hand who still aren't who still don't want to give TDD a try? Do you have any questions or any any concerns? Yes. I have a question. So I'm actually not a developer. I'm a manager, and one of the things that has been difficult is getting a team of engineers who are not. Have, have really never had any experience with uh, TDD to, to build confidence in their own skills and to actually learn how to do it and do it well. I don't think they have that. I mean, as far as understanding that concept, it's, it's really hard for them to grasp right now. Yes. Um, so is there information that I can, you know, give them that would kind of help guide them? So there's a... This is something Kay knows that I've, it happens to be dear to my heart. Um, I have, I've worked with this specific, I've mentored teams under this specific scenario um, a few times and have been successful at, at test infecting the whole team. And um, how that's done is by showing as much support as you can show. And you'd asked about, well, what type of training do I provide them? Um, I wish I, I should have prepared that and had a, I have a blog post up that talks about how to convert a team over. It's called Test Infecting a Development Team. I actually sent that out recently. Oh, did you? <laughs> and um, so the, the important thing is that there's users groups. There, there are, you can bring people in, um, at which local companies here are doing. I've, I've helped in that. Um, and um, you, can, you can have them read books. You can, you can just have successes of, I want everybody to try. I, I heard of a certain organization that 
gave away monitors, LCD monitors, this is the time when there was a transition between the two, gave away LCD monitors for the first, was it 10 unit tests or something? So after somebody wrote a certain number of unit tests, they got their LCD monitor. Um, so again, that's not necessarily TDD, but there's, there's two hurdles to jump. Right. There's unit testing and there's TDD. Right. In my opinion, I think you should just go TDD. Um, but in the middle of a project, that might be hard because stuff code's already been written, it's already been written a certain way, uh, which I think Jean's presentation after K's will be really good. His, his tutorial will be really good at that one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.